Have you ever been around somebody who could do something that you couldn't do? <laughs> and you looked at them and you're like, wow, that's, that's crazy that, that you can do that. I remember as a 17-year-old kid, I, I walked into a gym, to a weightlifting gym. I had gotten invited by a buddy of mine. He was working out at this gym. Little did I know that it was at the back of a VCR repair store. That's how old I am, y'all. Some of you don't even know what a VCR is. It was at the back of a VCR repair shop. A guy by the name of Randy Meese owned the VCR repair shop and had built a gym. And Randy became one of my first mentors. He was, he was a highly influential person in my life. He's with Jesus now. He died right before COVID. His wife remarried, and she comes about quarterly and visits here at Graceway. I get to see her uh, fairly often. But an, an important person in my life. I walked in this gym, and, uh, and I was a skinny kid. Um, played, played soccer and, and was running around doing all those things. So I was a, a skinny kid. I walked in, and I saw all these these human beings in the shape of a gorilla, right? Like, what, who, how, what, like, how would somebody? And so I pulled Randy to the side and I said, how, how are these guys lifting these weights? How are these guys getting this, be like, this, this, this dude's humongous. And, and he said, well, just hang out, watch what we do, watch how we do it, and then you do it. I said, that's it? And he goes, that's it. It'll take some time, but you just watch us, watch how we do it, and, and then you do it. Okay, I, I, I can do that. And I did over time, and, and, and that's a different story, all right? Second story is uh, I had another mentor in my life. His name was Frank Pardue. He was a teaching pastor of the church that uh, God saved me in. And, and Frank was a significant person to me. Um, I grew up in Ohio. He had gone and become a lead pastor in, in Florida. I had a conversation with him on a Thursday evening, and the conversation was about whether or not he would give me his blessing and come up and do the wedding to, to, to some gal by the name of Ashley Davenport, right? And, uh, and he gave me his blessing and said, of course, I would love to come up. He was a significant father figure to me. The next day, on the way home from the office, he had a massive brain aneurysm, and on Sunday, he was with Jesus. And at his, the dinner following his funeral, his wife came up to me and she said, Frank loved you, and Frank believed you were going to be a great leader, and he wants you to have this. She handed me a shoebox, and I opened it up, and inside was a bunch of cassettes from a guy by the name of John Maxwell. Now, at the time, nobody had heard of John Maxwell. Now everybody has heard of John Maxwell, but I listened to all of those tapes over and over and over again, and in those tapes, one of the stories that John Maxwell told was of a young man coming up to him and saying, I finally realized what God wants me to do with my life, and he said, what does God want you to do? And he says, he wants me to do what you do. And Maxwell said to him, you think that you, you're supposed to do what I do. He, let, me, let me explain something to you. You actually want to have what I have, but you don't want to do what I do. Here's, here's the idea. Um, watch, do, have. That's discipleship, isn't it? Watch, do, have. And, and I tell you those stories, uh, for one, because you need a, you need a mentor, you need stories in your life like I have. Can I tell you, I've got bad stories in my life. I have people who have done me dirt, people who have betrayed me. But the amount of stories of someone who has blessed me far outweigh the people who have, who have betrayed me. And some of y'all, you're collecting betrayals because you don't have someone who's investing in you. And so I need you to go to Growth Track. Let me invest in you today, okay? After this service, let me invest in you. We'll watch Kids Got Snacks for you. Let me make an investment into you. And sign up for D1. Get a mentor. If you want to be a mentor, you can come to the training, but you need stories of people who, even if they're with Jesus, they handed you a shoebox, they taught you a skill, they pointed you to Jesus. This is an important part of your faith. Back to this idea of, of watching and then doing so that I've used this principle for 30 years in my life. I see something that I don't have that I feel like I need or that I want, and I start looking around for who's doing it or for who has it, like this. Um, maybe you think to yourself, I need a better marriage. What should I do? You should find somebody who has a great marriage. And you should watch them. And then you should develop a relationship with them and humble yourself and say, what do you do that makes your marriage what it is? And then you should, you should do it. You shouldn't go, oh, that's dumb. Well, they have something you don't have. So you should do it and then you'll have what they have. Some of you say, man, I really want to get fit. I want to get in shape. I should go out and buy a bunch of spandex and get a gym membership I can't afford. No, 
you should find somebody who's in shape and you should watch what they eat and where they go and how they organize their time. And then you should develop a relationship and you should say, how do you do what you do? And then you should do it and then you will have what they have. It's true across the board. I spend time with people who have what I don't have but that I want and I learn and then I do and then I I have. Can I tell you, you're getting the results that your thoughts, habits, and beliefs deserve. Yeah, a couple of you got it, but a couple of you didn't. (laughs) You're you're getting the results that your thoughts, your habits, and your beliefs deserve. And and some of you need somebody to come alongside and help you think differently. Help you have different habits, help you believe different things, help you organize your life in a different way so that you can watch them do what they do and have what they have. Can I I be honest with you? Uh, I deeply love Jesus, but sometimes I get stuck in my Christian faith. Sometimes I get stuck. It's not that I don't love Jesus, just that sometimes I, I've been doing it too long. I need some new wineskin. I need some new revelation. And one of the areas that I tend to get stuck is prayer. Now, I legitimately, I'm a, I am a praying man, but prayer does not come easy to me. Prayer is difficult to me. Prayer is work for me. And there are times when I'm praying that I make this statement to God. Why isn't this working? Why aren't my prayers working? Why aren't you hearing me? I feel like I'm doing the right thing. I'm saying the right thing. I, I, I don't, I'm holding my hands out. I'm standing on one leg. I'm fast. I'm like, what? What? Which is why Ephesians 3 is so helpful. Because Paul is going to pray. And today, I want us to watch Paul while he prays. I want us to observe what he prays. And then I want us to do what Paul does so that we can have what Paul has. Let's read it together. Ephesians 3 and verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. That according to the riches of his glory he might grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love might have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Paul says, for this reason, I bow my knee before the Father. For what reason, Paul? With the reason that he said last week, that a mystery had been revealed to him, a mystery that had not been revealed to generations before, but had now been revealed to the apostles and the prophets of which he was one. Paul says there is something that God is doing that he intended always to do, but we didn't know he was going to do it, but now we do know that he's going to do it, and God put me in charge of it. This mystery that the Gentiles become heirs and partakers of the promise. This mystery that God always intended to save everyone. This mystery that God doesn't just love the Jews, he loved everyone. So he sent his son so that whosoever believed in him could have eternal life. It was a mystery, but now it's been revealed. And Paul acknowledges the scope of his responsibility isn't just human, it's the spirit world as well. You think you got a lot to do. You think you've got a lot of responsibility. I just got to tell an entire group of people, basically just everyone not a Jew, that God loves them, has plans for their life, and spiritual principalities and powers in light and in dark are watching to see what I'm doing. Woo! Hello. He also intimates that he, he might not be qualified to handle the responsibility. He says, I'm the least of the saints. I, I got this enormous job. This enormous job, and I'm the least of the saints. Have you ever had anyone say to you, God will never give you more than you can handle? Can we just put this to rest? This is not in the Bible, and it is not in the lexicon of commonsensical phrases and ideas. God regularly gives you more than you can handle, but he will never give you more than he can handle. But to assume that because God can handle it, you can handle it, is a fallacy that will mess your life up. Come on, somebody. God regularly gives you more than you can handle. And God had given Paul more than he could handle. Now, what what does he do? He doesn't psych himself up. Like, okay, yeah, come on. Yeah, let's go. 
God, I'm going to do this. He doesn't do that. <laughs> he doesn't strategize. He doesn't buy a pack of cigarettes and get a whiteboard and start, okay, let's here's the nations and, you know, and this and that. And you, you go talk to that foundation, the Coffin Foundation. You go talk to the, yeah, he, he doesn't do that. He also doesn't wilt. He doesn't get insecure and say, man, I can't believe God would. God can't use me. God can never. He, do he doesn't do any of that. What's he do? He prays. He prays. For this reason, there are all these things. I bow my knee. Now, standing was the typical posture for a Jew. When you read through the Gospels, you see stories of people praying and they're standing. The only time that a Jew would kneel was when they were overwhelmed by and led to fervent and earnest prayer. So Paul is saying, this is overwhelming me, y'all. I can't be standing while I'm praying. I, 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 I am on my knees about this. And Paul prays for three things. Paul prays for three things. Number one, Paul prays for strength. He prays for strength. And the word that he uses is the ability to overcome resistance. He doesn't pray for big biceps, okay? Curls for the girls, tries for the guys. That's not what he prays for. No, no, he prays for the ability to overcome resistance. Ephesians chapter six, in just a couple chapters, he'll talk about the reality of our resistance, that my resistance isn't what I can see. It's not flesh and blood. It's not my circumstances. And this is instructive to me because I always think that my problems are what I can see. I always think that my problems have a name and that I can point to them and go, you, you're my problem. Paul says, no, they're never your problem. Your resistance doesn't come from flesh and blood. It, your resistance isn't your circumstances. Your resistance is spiritual principalities and powers. Yeah. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. So watch, our war isn't flesh and blood. And our weapons aren't flesh and blood, which means that my problems aren't flesh and blood, which means that my solutions aren't flesh and blood. But most of us spend a lot of time strategizing about flesh and blood, blood solutions. I need a new job. I need more money. I need a better truck. I need a better spouse. And some of y'all got the money, got the truck, got the job, got the spouse, and your life ain't better because they were never your problem. They were never your problem. Our true solutions, our true solutions are spiritual and the spiritual effect on the tangible. But when you come through the tangible, it doesn't get to the spiritual. You come from the spiritual, it affects the tangible. Are you with me? So Paul is praying for strength through presence. That's what he prays. God, I pray for strength through your dwelling. And he's not talking about lodging like an Airbnb. He's talking about like somebody that has moved in. He's talking about residence. Listen to how 1 John 4, 4 says it. Little children, you are from God and you have overcome them. For he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Paul says the strength that I need isn't this. The strength that I need is inside of me. And what's inside of me is greater than anything that I'll face outside of me. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 16, so we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. I talked to you about going into that gym as a 17-year-old. Can I tell you that there came a point that I was able to lift a lot of weight, all right? These days, I can't lift that much weight. I can still lift more weight than most of you. Come on, somebody, all right? But I'm just trying to spit the truth here, all right? I'm just trying to keep it real. But I can't, I can't lift as much as I used to live. Why? Because I'm 46. Because my joints don't do that anymore. All right? Why? Because my outer body is fading away. If you're depending on this to keep you strong, good luck. If you're depending on this to keep you strong, for real, good luck. You can't even remember the word strong, right? <laughs> like, what? Where's my keys? Where's my, yeah. Yeah, this is fading away, but... Our inner self is being renewed day by day. My strength isn't tied to this. My strength is tied to this. Paul is, is praying about strength from submitting. Okay, watch. This is the prayer. God, I know that you are in me, that you have residence in me. God, I thank you that you don't come and go. God, I need your presence. God, I need the strength that comes wherever you are, strength is, God. And you are in me. And why you chose to live in me, I'll never know. But I'm grateful to be your temple. 
And God, I need your strength in me and I need your strength through me. So I yield myself, I yield my strength to your strength. I yield my solutions to your solutions. I yield my thoughts to your thoughts. I yield my ways to your ways. I need your power and I receive your power through Jesus. Paul prays for strength. Secondly, Paul prays to be rooted and grounded. Now in Greek, it's a little, it's a little complicated what he says, but he's trying to paint two pictures. The first is a botanical reference. He says, I want you to be rooted like, like a tree that has roots that go deep down into the ground, deep, thick roots that even if the wind comes, nothing happens to that tree. Are you with me? The second is grounded, and he makes an architectural reference. It's a foundational reference, that, that you are on a foundation that is sure, that your foundation, Jesus would say, is on a rock, not on the sand. And when the wind and the waves come and the storm hits your life, your foundation holds. So Paul prays for strength, and he says, I pray that you be rooted and grounded, number two, in love. Rooted and grounded in love. And the, the words that Paul uses... He, he talks about them in perfect tense, meaning something that is currently happening based on something that has already occurred. I pray that you be rooted in the love of God for something that Jesus already did. I pray that your foundation is Jesus loves me, this I know. Why? Because God intended for it to be so. I just made that up on my own, all right? You can find that on Spotify later today. Yeah, so, so Paul says a perfect tense, rooting and grounding, and the knowing, the comprehending, don't miss this, isn't intellectual. Paul isn't saying, I want you to intellectually know. Here's why. Most Christians intellectually know Jesus loves them. I just sang the song. Jesus loves me, this I Hey, come on. No, it's trademarked, all right? Yeah, for the Bible tells me so. You know, you know. Then why are you so easily moved? Because knowing isn't enough. Knowing isn't enough. That's not what Paul says. He doesn't say, I pray they know words on a praise page. He says, I pray they experience it. The kind of knowing that comes from experiencing it. He calls it comprehending the breadth, width, height, and depth of God's love. Which is crazy because the Greeks only thought about three dimensions, and Paul references four. He's like, there's a depth of God's love y'all don't even know exists. I pray that you experience the love of God in multi-dimensional, high-def, full color, with premium Bose surround sound. That's what he prays. Not I read it one time, not I went to church and somebody told me, not I can sing a cute little song as a kid. No, 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 I... I experience it in, in the present. Many of you have heard of the old hymn, The Love of God. It was written by a guy named Frank Lehman who helped found the Nazarene Publishing House here in Kansas City, 1911, still exists to this day. Frank was a serial entrepreneur, went through some unfortunate events, lost his ministry and his business, had to move to California to work in a packing house. Even though his, his life had kind of fallen apart, his his faith was founded, was rooted, so he never wavered. And so during his breaks, he would write songs. During his breaks, he would write hymns describing how much God loved him. Now at the time, songs were considered three stanzas and a refrain. It wasn't a song until he had three and a refrain. So during breaks, Frank would write, and he came up with two really easily and a refrain, but he couldn't get that third stanza. So he went home one night, he sat down at the piano, and he said, I'm going to write the melody for this, even though I don't have the third stanza. He's playing along, nothing comes, no creative juice, he's doing all the different things, nothing's working, until he remembers a poem that he had recorded on a card and had been using as a bookmark. He pulled it out, he realized that the poem was a perfect third stanza. He sat it down, he began to continue, and he noticed a little note at the bottom of the card, and it said this, these words were found written on a cell wall in a prison some 200 years ago. It is not known why the prisoner was incarcerated, neither is it known if the words were original or if he had heard them somewhere and had decided to put them in a place where he could be reminded of the greatness of God's love. Whatever the circumstances, he wrote them on the wall of his prison cell. In due time, he died. 
And the men who had the job of repainting his cell were so impressed by the words, before their paintbrushes had obliterated them, one of the men jotted them down, and thus they were preserved as such. Could we with ink the ocean fill? And were the skies of parchment made? Were every stock on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole though stretched from sky to sky. You sing it, or you have sang it. But a man in a prison cell experienced the love of God as so deep that if you used all of the water in the ocean, you would run out of ink before you ran out of love. What is Paul praying? He's praying, God, I pray that I'm swimming in the love of God. Not, not in a lap pool in the ocean. You ever try to swim in the ocean? It's an overwhelming experience. It's an overwhelming experience. And so is the love of God. I pray that God's love is written on my heart. I pray that I am rooted in the love of God. I pray that my foundation is secure, that come hell and high water, that come wind and rain, that I am not moved from the love of God for me or in me. Doesn't matter what you think about me. Doesn't matter what you say about me. I know who I am. I know that I'm loved by God, and nothing can change that. Thirdly, Paul prays for filling. To be filled, here's the phrase, filled with the fullness of God, which is like saying God is an ocean and you are a Dixie cup. Right? You want me to be filled with the fullness of God? How is that going to work? God's big and, and I'm not. And let me just remind you, God is big and you, you are not. I know you like to feel like you are, but when it comes to God, God's an ocean and you are a Dixie cup. And Paul prays, I pray that I'm filled with the fullness of God. And what is he saying? He's saying, God, fill me to overflow. Let it be that your strength, that your love, that your presence pours out of me, God. God, I need and I receive your power. God, I need and I receive your love. God, I need and I receive your fullness, your filling. Notice, notice this. Paul has this massive job, but he doesn't pray to do anything. He prays to receive. Don't miss that. Paul doesn't pray to do. Paul doesn't, Paul doesn't pray, I got this going on, this going on. Here's my to-do list, Lord. Here's my needs. Here's the stuff that I want. Bup, 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 bup. He prays to receive. How, how many of you when, you, when you pray, you pray about all the things you have to do? Paul doesn't do that. Watch, watch what Paul does. Do what Paul does so you can have what Paul has. Paul doesn't, Paul's got to go reach the Gentiles. And he says, for this reason I pray, and he prays to receive something, notice, that he already has. Okay, here's, here's how I want to do this. Um, maybe you're like me, and you've had times where you say, why aren't my prayers working? Why isn't this working? Okay, so, so let me clarify on, on two fronts. Uh, one, if you're praying, you're praying correctly. If you're praying you're praying correctly. Because I know that a lot of you are like, maybe I'm not doing it right. If you're praying, you're praying correctly. The problem is that some of us aren't praying. So if you aren't praying, here's your assignment. This week, begin to pray. If you are praying, there are going to be times where you're doing it right, but it gets a little stale. You're doing it right, but you need some new wineskin. You're doing it right, and Paul gives us a great opportunity here. I'm gonna watch how Paul prays. So let me give you three things that will strengthen your prayer life. Are you with me? Okay. Uh, the reason my prayers aren't working is because I'm praying out of order. I'm praying out of order. Pray first. Paul, Paul doesn't, yeah, come on. Paul doesn't strategize. Paul doesn't freak out. For this reason, I bow my knee. Because of what I'm called to, because of what's going on, because of how I'm feeling, I, I, I pray. I pray. Not as a last resort, as a first option. Not once my ideas have been exhausted, my counsel has been exhausted, my money has been exhausted. Fine, our Heavenly Father. No, first, first. Are you stuck anywhere? Do you need anything? You have something that you're hoping for? Pray. 
Pray. Pray first. You say, I'm praying. Pray more. Pray, pray fervently. Bow your knees. Submit yourself. Pray and fast. Call somebody to you and say, can you pray this with me? Try something else. But prayer isn't an option. Prayer is the option to Paul. Now, do understand that Paul was, a, was a, an accomplished guy. P Paul had multiple PhDs. Paul had a network. Paul had funding. Paul had all these things. Paul prays first. Why aren't my prayers working? Because you're praying second. And God regularly says, I want first. Put me first. Give me first. Pray my will first. You don't see anywhere in the Bible where God says, go ahead and make me third. So, so part of the reason is, is you're praying out of order. Secondly, part of the reason is you're praying for something. You say, what? <laughs> of course I'm praying for something. There's things that I need. Uh, you're praying practicality. You're praying circumstances. So let me just shift it just a little bit. Instead of praying for something, I need you to pray from something. Notice, Paul had needs. Paul had stuff to do. Paul doesn't ask to do, Paul asks to receive. And everything he asked to receive, he already had. When he says, God, I need strength that comes from your presence, it wasn't like I was like, oh, we got to get over to Paul and give him our strength. No, he was already there. When he said, help me to understand your love, it wasn't that God was like, oh, show him a little bit more love. When he said, help me, help me to be more full, God wasn't like, give him a little bit more of us. No, no, he was doing what scripture says. Come into my courts with thanksgiving and pray. Here, can I tell you part of the reason you hate praying is because prayer is just a, an exercise in discouragement for you, okay? God, here, our Father, heart in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom, come on, okay, here's everything that I need. Here's my to-do list. Here's everything that's wrong. Here's all the stuff I've screwed up. Here's all the screwed up, screwed up people that you got doing screwed up stuff around me. Here, here's all the needs that I'm still praying for. Here's all the stuff that I'm struggling with. In Jesus' name, amen. You're praying for stuff, not from stuff. So, so what would it be if God, knowing what you need, if you prayed like this, God, I thank you that I have everything that I need in Jesus. God, I thank you that you are my provider and that you are my protector. God, I thank you that you are my strong tower, tower, that the righteous run into it and that they're safe. God, I thank you that you are my shepherd. And right now, it does feel like you are walking me through the valley of the shadow of death. So I thank you that you are with me. I thank you that you walk me beside green pastures and that you lead me beside still waters. I thank you that that person who's trying to kill me, you make a meal in front of them. Come on, somebody, right? I thank you, Lord. I thank you that I'm never alone. I thank you that you never leave me or forsake me. I thank you that you work everything together for my good. I thank you, Lord, that you win and that you're my banner of victory. I thank, right? How many of you would enjoy prayer a little bit more if you didn't just show up to God with all the stuff you needed and instead you started with everything that you had? With everything that you had. Here's, here's what I wanna propose to you. I wanna propose to you that if you'll start with from instead of starting with for. It will not only change your enjoyment of prayer, but it will change also what you're asking for because you're going to find out that you already have some of the stuff that you're asking for. Pray the promises of God. Stand on the promises of God. Say to God, I know I already have it, but I just want you to know that I know. And, and in so doing, you're reminding yourself as you're thanking God, oh, oh wow, I am blessed. Oh wow, I am favored. Oh wow, I am loved. Oh wow, I do have strength. Oh, oh, oh yeah, my, okay, yeah, yeah. Some of y'all, if you, if you worshiped a little bit more and asked for a little bit less, now I'm not saying don't ask, but it depends on where you start. It depends on your perspective. And Paul had needs. You read Paul's life. He had a rough life, man. You never see him saying, could I please stop being thrown in prison? Yeah. That's what I'd be praying. Bro, enough already, man. Could I please stop being shipwrecked? Could I please have people stop punching me in the face for being a Christian? That's what I'd be praying. You don't see Paul pray that. 
which shows me. Watch him. Watch him. Watch what he does. Do what he does so you can have what he has. Paul always prays, God, remind me what I have. Remind me who I am. Remind me what you're doing. Part of the reason you're struggling is you're praying out of order and you're praying for something instead of from something. And then lastly, and this one's, this one's simple, but it's big. Your prayers are too small. Your prayers are too small. Okay, so let me, let me pass you for a second here, okay? You, you, don't need to, you don't need to pray for what God has already said. You just need to obey what God has already said, okay? Okay, listen, you don't need to ask God how to handle that offense. He already told you. You just need to do it. You don't need to ask God to forgive them. You need to forgive them. You don't need to ask God to give you more. God, give me more. God's like, I, I already gave you some. You haven't been faithful with what I gave you. And God says, how am I going to give you more? You haven't been faithful with little. I remember I, I've had so many conversations with people who feel like God told them something that they didn't need to do that God told them they need to do in Scripture. I got sideways with them, and, and God told me that I didn't need to go talk to them. And God's like, uh, I feel like I did say that if you are offended or your brother is offended, go to them. So instead of praying, obey. Let's just, let's call it what it is. Some of y'all are praying for what you already know, hoping that God's going to change his mind on what he's already said. And part of the reason that God's not answering the prayer is that God's not redundant. You need to obey. You want God to bless your finances, tithe. You, you want God to bless your relationships, forgive. You, you want God to bless your work, be a better employee. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Come on, I love you. I love you. But we got to call it what it is. You're praying for stuff you already know and that God's already said. So not only are you praying small prayers, you're, you're praying silly prayers. All due respect, I pray silly prayers all the time. But, but be a person of the book so you can pray God's word and so you don't pray for stuff that God already told you. Okay, all right. Uh, I've also found, are you, you know I love you, right? We good? I've also found that God won't do what I can. So a lot of times I come to God and I'm praying for stuff that fits in here, in, the, in, this, in this bald cranium and imagination. This is how I think it should go, God. And so I, I'm praying that, okay? Instead of praying to a God who can do exceeding abundantly above what I can ask or think. So instead of praying, God, I pray that they do, I say, God, I, I pray that, your will would be done regarding this. Help me to see it as it is. Help me to see it as you see it. Help me to understand it as you see it. God, I see it this way, but there's a high likelihood that I'm wrong. And, and if I see it that way, I'm going to pray in accordance with what I see. So change what I see so I can pray your will. And, and then thirdly, uh, pray believing. Now, this is massive. This is massive. Um, a lot of us, if we're honest, when we pray, we pray because it feels like the right thing to do, but you, look at my face, you don't believe that God's gonna do it. Come on, let's just call it what it is. God, redeem my marriage. And you're like, bro. <laughs> God ain't gonna redeem my marriage. God, save my kids. But bro, have you met my kids? Like, no. God, God, Heal my finances. Like, you don't believe it. And that's why it's not working. You, you have to pray. You have to pray it done. Meaning, pray in present tense. What does it mean to, to pray in present tense? Your marriage is screwed up, so here's what you pray. God, I thank you that my marriage is thriving. God, I thank you that my marriage is thriving. And everyone's like, his marriage isn't thriving. No, no, you can't see with your physical eyes what he's praying with his spiritual eyes. God, I thank you that I'm healed. Uh, the doc just said you aren't healed. No, no, I, I'm praying in faith. And if God's will is to heal me, then it is not it will be done. It is done. God, I thank you that, that I am provided for. Because that's what scripture says, right? That I'm provided for. Jehovah Jireh. 
God, I thank you that I'm provided for. You look, your, your spouse looks at your brother, we ain't provided for. No, no. I am, I am standing on the promises of God. I am praying from, not for. Jesus said in Matthew 21, truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say the mountain be taken up and thrown to the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Now listen to me for a second. Don't hear that like an American. <laughs> oh, cool, so then if I pray this way, I get what I want. You're, you're missing it. I'm, I'm praying a submitted prayer, acknowledging my weakness, acknowledging my brokenness, acknowledging my flaw, coming to God and saying, God, I want what you want, and I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that you do whatever you want, and so I'm praying that done in my life. And God says, if you pray that, I will move a mountain from there to the sea. Not you, not you, it isn't your power. Remember, Paul says, give me power, because I don't have it. So don't get crazy here with the name and claim it buffoonery. That ain't in the Bible. This is vulnerable, submitted. God, I'm praying a future that I can't see. But in faith, I believe that you can. And if it is your will, you not will bring it to pass. You have brought it to pass. And I claim it in faith. I'm praying with spiritual eyes. So here's your assignment. Here's your assignment. And I'm in my seat. Okay? I want you this week to write out your three biggest challenges. Okay, not in your mind, I was driving down the road. No, no, sit down and write out your three biggest challenges because you're walking around with them. Yeah. And I, 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 wanna, I want you to give them to God. So here's the exercise. I want you to write out your three biggest challenges and I want you to write them as specifically as you feel. My marriage. No, what about your marriage? Okay. And, and then I want you to do these three things. I want you to pray first. I want you to pray first. If every time you come up in worry, you pray, you'll be praying without ceasing. So just make the trade. You're stressed out about your marriage, you pray. You're stressed out about your kids, you pray. You're stressed out about your finances, you pray. You're stressed out about your work, you pray. And it doesn't have to be some long ornate thing. Lord, I give this to you right now. Lord, this is heavy for me. Lord, hear me quickly. Lord, see, see my stress. Lord, see my wrinkles. Lord, see the stress in my back. And, and come to me quickly. Be present with me quickly. I pray first, and I pray his will first. I don't come to God with a list and say, here's what I need, God, holy ATM. No, no, I pray first, and I pray thy will be done. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, in this as it is in heaven. I'm praying first. I'm asking first. I don't have any plans, Lord. You're my plan. Then number two, I pray from, not for. I pray first, and I pray from. God, I thank you that I'm a daughter of the Most High King. God, I thank you that I'm valuable no matter what they say. God, I thank you that I'm pure no matter what they say. God, I thank you that I have dignity no matter what they say. God, I thank you that you are the cleft of the rock that keeps me safe. I thank you that you spread your wings over me. I thank you that you own the, th the, cows, the cattle on a thousand hill, that everything is yours, that you're my provider. I thank you that you hear me when I pray. Lord, I'm coming to you with eyes that see flesh and blood, and I thank you that you don't operate in flesh and blood, but you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And then lastly, I want you to pray big. In faith, believing, present tense, I thank you that it's done. And everyone's going to be looking at you like you're, like you're crazy because they don't need the faith that you need. And they don't serve the God that you serve. Lord, I'm believing that I'm healed. I'm believing that God's coming through. I'm believing that God's going to redeem. I'm, I'm believing that it's done. I just, haven't, I just haven't happened upon it yet. Big prayers give God big glory. I want you to write it out. Pray first, pray from, pray big. And then lastly, some of you, um, you need prayed for. <laughs> you got something that's going on, and, and, and instead of going that way and just picking that luggage back up, I want you to come down front. Our prayer team's 
I'm going to be down front. I want you to let us bless you today. Let us meet you with whatever's going on. Let us, let us ask God to part the clouds, give you eyes to see, give you ears to hear, and then you go out and then you pray. But some of you need to come down and you need to get prayer first. And so I want you to do that before you leave. God, we love you today. And God, I thank you that you are a God who hears, that you are a God who works, that you are a God who is near. I thank you that you are over all principalities and powers. It's all yours, that you are over time, that what you have done is already done. So, Lord, even though we are in the in-between, even though we see with physical eyes and flesh and blood, Lord, I pray that you'll give us spiritual ears and eyes to be a part of what you're doing, to pray in faith, to pray first, to pray from, Lord, to pray big. I pray that as we exercise these new wineskins, that you pour new wine in, that you give us new revelation, experiences of who you are, Lord, to understand you more deeply, to be rooted and grounded, to be strengthened, to be filled to the full for your glory, God, and our joy. In Jesus' name.